Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. This episode is called, This Bear Wanted to Kill His Food. In the vast Canadian North Country, the natives live in close relationship with their environment. Their day-to-day -day activities revolve around basic substance. They rely primarily and frequently on native and local sources of food, including seals, whales, walruses, and occasionally polar bears. Tok was a member of the First Nations people in the northern Arctic regions of the Canadian North. He and his cousin Nat were planning their typical seal hunting trip, which consisted of a few days crossing ice flows and expansive Arctic ice capes in search of favorable places to catch and kill seals. They really had no way to predict what type or species of seal they would find and basically had to accept whatever came their way. Relying on their wit, experience, and resourcefulness to get them out of any bind that may arise. After rounding up their firearms and other needed equipment, Tok and Nat loaded up their snowmobiles for their trip. In recent decades, the indigenous people had given in to the easier and more comfortable amenities of modern life, while still clinging to their way of life and whatever cultural remnants they could. Indigenous people of the north of prior generations utilized sled dogs, atlatls, spears, and whale ivory hooks to catch and kill much of their food, but today's indigenous people frequently trade the old methods for modern ones and unfortunately lose their own cultural uniqueness in the exchange. The loud engines wind up as the young men pull away from their village and they line out single file for the 47 mile trip to their favorite seal hunting ground. The spring snow was turning into slush during the daytime but would freeze hard at night and allow the seal hunters to cross muddy or boggy areas easily on their snow machines. As the comfort of their village fades away, they are filled with a sense of adventure and freedom that only wilderness can bring. Living this close to the land does have its rewards and its perils. The young hunters traveled the 47 mile distance with, within an hour or so and arrived at the edge of the land and the expanse of the sea opened up. Although it was still frozen, it was the only place that they would find the seals they were hunting as the seals do not go inland far enough to be hunted. The men hiked along the edge of the ice flows covering the sea in search of a seal breathing hole. This is a hole in the ice that seals use to emerge from the icy waters to breathe or rest. At times, they will swim up through the hole and climb out onto the sea ice to lay in the scarce sunlight or sleep or have their babies. After some searching, the men found what they were looking for. There was a hole in the ice, about 18 inches across, that had obvious signs of being used by seals. The experienced subsistence hunters also knew that the seals would have these holes about every quarter mile or so apart, so Nat planned to move on and find another breathing hole to hunt over. Before he departed, he would help Tok set up his hunting position. The two men positioned a snow blind next to the hole so that the seals would not see talk as they emerged and Nat began his trek to find a second breathing hole. Hunting seals in this manner required a tremendous amount of patience. The seals could choose a breathing hole at random and waiting motionless for hours hoping they would choose this particular breathing hole was a calculated risk. In the old days the indigenous people would use Atlatls are spears to harvest the animal, but today the men were using small caliber rifles. As Tok gazed into the frigid sea water filling the breathing hole, his mind wandered to various other things he could be doing. He thought of his chores and repairs on his house he needs to complete while waiting for the sea water in the breathing hole to stir, signaling an approaching seal. Hours passed and the patient ice hunter barely moved from his initial position to avoid giving himself away. Tok's eyes stared blankly at the breathing hole as he had held his rifle aimed at the hole ready for a seal to appear at any minute. Suddenly he heard a noise to his right and behind him. Slowly he turned his head and he saw the immense shape of a giant male polar bear only four feet from him. 
The stealthy Arctic assassin had padded up on the hunter without being noticed and now was dangerously close. Tok's mind started to race as adrenaline flooded his body. He knew he would not want to make any sudden movements or run away as that would trigger the polar bear's predatory instincts and he would be done in no time. Tok's knees began to shake uncontrollably and he fought the instinct to run. As the polar bear looked him up and down, calculating exactly what he should do, Tok began to feel overwhelmed and started to accept his apparent fate. He realized the bear was too close for him to spin around and shoot at, and he crumbled to the ground in acceptance of his fate. He lay still and held his breath in terror, devoid of any reasonable alternative. With his eyes closed, Tok could hear the massive bear slowly walk up beside him and could hear his giant breath of the sea ice predator. He suddenly felt the cold rubbery nose of the polar bear on his cheek as the bear examined him for life. The bear sniffed Tok up and down looking for signs of life. His breathing, his breath smelled like a combination of fish and putrefaction and Tok struggled to control his fear and move or try to get away. After slobbering all over Tok's face while sniffing him, the bear sniffed the ground like a giant hound dog. He slowly wandered off as he followed Nat's tracks in the snow. As soon as the bear was a few yards away, Tok opened his eyes and cautiously watched the bear disappear from sight. Tok sat up and had a hard time regaining his feet due to the adrenaline dump from the experience. He knew that he did not want to follow the bear and chose instead to run all the way back to his snowmobile. He covered the return trip in record time and roused the men of the village to return to find his friend. As the search party arrived at Tok's hunting site, they could see the bear's giant tracks in the snow as he followed gnats. The men kept a wary eye out for the bear and followed hoping to find him before he could cause any danger or damage. Before we bring our tragic and frightening story to a conclusion, we want to remind you to subscribe to Scary Bear Attacks to receive instant notification of our latest stories and be apprised of the most frightening details of the encounters between man and beast. They rounded the last ice berm and finally stumbled upon the half-eaten corpse of their friend and family member, Nat. The bear had apparently quickly dispatched the hunter with a bite to the head and neck and then devoured Nat, starting with his organs and finishing with his arms and legs until he ate his fill. Blood, tissue, and other bodily fluids were scattered all over the area. The encounter was apparently not without risk for the bear, as the men could see a slight blood trail in the bear tracks as he left the kill site. The men recovered what remained of Nat and brought him back to the village for burial and mourning. Nanook, as the indigenous people call him, had claimed another victim of the icy north. <laughs>